Well, Aaron, thank you so much for uh, helping my projects and um, your flexibility and patience and everything. Can you um, say a little bit about yourself? So, um, okay, so I have been interested in space my whole life. Um, my mom bought me a space shuttle operator's manual when I was, geez, I was 12, 13. Um, I remember reading that book when Challenger blew up on the school bus. And I was the instant expert on everything that was going on in the news and everything for about two weeks. That, that was an interesting experience. Um, I joined the Air Force straight out of high school. Uh, that was more because of the domestic environment uh, between my mom and my dad being divorced. And uh, my uh, mom and, and her remarrying and living in Iowa and, and wanting out of the middle of that. Uh, they said, join the Air Force, see the world. Uh, they sent me to Biloxi, Mississippi, Texas, and uh, uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And for somebody who's been born and raised in Wyoming and, uh, you know, Iowa, uh, that was culture shock. <laughs> uh, so they... They stationed me with the 1000 Satellite Operations Group, what became 6 Space Operations Squadron, flying Defense Meteorological Satellite Program. So at 18, I was in space, which, um, and, and this thought hit me, of course, last night as I'm going to bed. And so, of course, I drove my wife nuts because I was like, crap, I got to write this down because it dawned on me. Um, so, the age of satellites is, is less than 50 years old, and I've been involved in the satellite field since 19, 1992, so just under 50% of the existence of that age, and I've been in it. Wow. That's scary. That, that's very scary. Um, I also, uh, as you can tell from my hat, uh, I'm into amateur radio, have been since high school. Um, and had a great instructor who uh, is uh, now Silent Key, no longer with us, uh, N0HTK, uh, Larry Watland. And he, uh, he did a lot to mentor me um, through a lot of that uh, growing up and everything. And he, he did a lot of things with you know teaching us about different things we could do. We did moon bounce. Uh, we did satellite work, things that you don't expect out of a small high school in the middle of Iowa. And that was really, that was really cool. So one of the really coolest experiences I ever got to experience uh, was being in a room and having a meeting canceled because one person was missing. He said, we just can't have the meeting. He's not here. And I couldn't figure out why. And it was because literally this, this guy was an expert on everything. And I, I'm like, I want to be that guy. So I, I, I was lucky enough, I spent six years with six ops. Um, it was 1000 Satellite Operations Group, and then you know we got reorganized, um, became a, a SOPS instead of a, a SOG. And um, then a brilliant idiot decided that we should be given over to Noah, who made a mess of the mission, screwed it all up so badly. Uh, after they sent me out here to Colorado Springs, I kept getting pulled back to my old job to help them, it was so bad. Um, to say they couldn't find their way out of a wet paper sack with a command to charge and a sharp knife was an understatement. It was bad. Um, I got to participate in three satellite launches. That was awesome. That, that was really uh, uh, neat to see that, be a part of that. Um, I got to work the simulator facility. I've got gotten to work the ground system software, got to fly the satellites. So I've gotten to see a wide range of that. Um, 
but I also hurt my back and got medically boarded out of the Air Force because of this. Um, so I got medically retired July uh, 2001. Uh, so September 11th comes along. I call up my medical board uh, person and say, I want back in. And she says, when they've invaded the US, they've crossed the Missouri River, we might get you a call. Wow. I'm like, so that's a no. Now, understand during the same time frame, I'm also a volunteer firefighter, EMS instructor. Um, I, I, my boss actually had to sit down and say, listen, the Air Force pays you to do software and fly satellites and that kind of stuff. We don't pay you to run into burning buildings. You, you're doing that for fun. I'm like, no, 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 you got it all backwards, man. You got it all backwards. It was, it was awesome. I mean, um, our fire truck got featured in uh, popular mechanics. Uh, our fire truck could drive sideways. It could spin in place. It, it, I love the fire trucks. I, I love this uh, normal with fire trucks or is your always a special one? It, it was a special one. Um, it, it's something they did develop as a um, something you could do, but the problem was you had to be really smart about it. Um, other departments didn't think about how to implement things and Council Bluffs kept taking out the center um, column between the bays because they would go out in fire ground mode and the back end would swing wide and they kept taking out that center pillar and that's that's a pretty hefty price tag every time you take it out. So it's about learning how to use the technology and when to use the technology appropriately. Um, yes, you can is the question, should you? So that, that um, becomes a very interesting question for me because I've gotten to see this from that aspect and then I've got the aspect of, you know, the fire and rescue background. Well, we've got these wonderful things. Now, how do we rescue somebody out of it? And that's something that um, when I first started down this, this path, I asked that of Rose Cosmos thinking, oh, well, obviously they're working on this. Nobody's working on this. Nobody cares. And I was floored. Nobody was doing anything on this. I was really, truly terrified when that hit me um and and that was that was an eye-opening experience for me so th this has become a couple of different things so backing up to 2001 when basically i got bounced out we also had the dot-com crash so everybody that had experience but no degrees couldn't find a job well that was me so i'm like okay i need to go back to school get a degree. Well, I was doing some teaching, you know, CPR, how to tear cars apart, which is absolutely my favorite class to teach. You know, here's, here's how you rip a car apart. I mean, I loved it. that, you know, my favorite thing to teach. Um, so I'm like, okay, I'll go back to school. I loved hazmat. Let's, let's get some stuff. Let's, let's go out and let's teach in the schools because they need it. They need people that can teach some of this stuff. Um, and then I got this crazy idea in my head that I should get a physics degree. Yeah, not the smartest idea I've ever had. I don't know. It sounds like a good idea to me. Why, why wasn't it smart? Um, it, there are things about a physics degree that I struggle with. I'm very much a hands-on kinesthetic learner. And there were things about the way the physics programs are structured and the way they do things. And my math is not the best. And one of the other mistakes I made was I tried to take calculus-based physics and calculus at the same time. Should never have done that. Um, and I paid for it dearly. Um, in fact, the, uh, what was really hilarious about this whole thing is at one point, uh, I've actually gone back and I have retaken every single math class I've ever taken at calculus level and above. I've 
retaken at least once, if not twice. So like Calc 1, I've retaken three times because I want to understand it better. I want to be better at it. Um, in retrospect, it didn't work out that way for me. So I'm right at the point where I'm going to graduate. And my disabilities got the better of me. I had a really bad semester. I crashed and burned. My voc rehab program's on the rocks. And I realized if I just go to him and say, well, I just screwed up, I'm toast. So I came to him and I said, yes, I screwed up, but here's my plan. Here's how I'm going to re, you know, rebuild, get back on my feet. He says, okay, since you came to me with a plan, since you obviously have a plan forward, I will let you do this. Um, next semester, straight A's. Uh, I put him in a really rough position. He was going to pull my program. I had no idea. He literally, he gave me the, that semester as a, a pity letdown to, to let me recognize that there wasn't any way I could do it. I literally made it through my school program because I wouldn't give up. I just, I was too stupid to, to fail. It's kind of, kind of, you, you know, key. exactly. I, and I think it wasn't a bad thing. Um, the other thing is we also discovered I had carpal tunnel bilaterally. So I was wearing wrist braces. I couldn't work as many problems as I needed to. Um, I'm, you know, I'm on a ton of meds that doesn't help things. Um, yeah, that was, I, I still remember there was one day we were working a problem in physics and it's seven, you know, six foot boards or eight foot boards. And I'm like, I understand every single one of these steps, but how did you know to start on this board over here and get all the way over to here? And I'm just like, yeah, I'm really in trouble. And it, it was a real challenge. I mean, I just, I flat out would not give up. And the cool part was I had a really awesome math instructor at community college that sent us to do a, gave us a project to do. I've never had a math class give me a project. And um, Jason, a friend of mine, did it with me and with another uh, guy, and I can't remember her name. He didn't, he didn't want any more of it. He was like, I, I took the class. That's all I needed. I'm moving on. So Jason and I took this, this thing where we actually, we looked at solar flares because this was pulling from my background, you know, because I understood the science behind it, everything, because this was something I worked on in the Air Force was solar flares and the, the messaging that goes out to warn people, hey, we got a solar flare coming in. So I knew where to go for the data. I knew how to pull this all together. Jason could help me with the math and um, Jason and I are still friends. We, we talk um, and we went down to Pueblo to, uh, it's now uh, Colorado State University Pueblo, where I actually went and finished up my teaching license. And they liked it so much, they had us out to Grand Junction to um, present out there. And we actually, they liked it so much, they had us present twice out there because we had so many people come in and they're like, we came in halfway through. Can you, would you guys mind just staying late and presenting again? And we're like, sure, we'll do that. And that became my senior seminar project for my physics degree. Um, so that, how many people have something that, that's done at a community college level that becomes that? Um, I had a little robotics project that became, you know, a flight test of Legos to 100,000 feet. Legos work at 100,000 feet. My little rover worked. Uh, nobody thought it would work. I had JPL basically trying to figure out a way to not laugh me out of the room. And I told him it'll work. And I worked with another guy out at uh, Schriever to build it. And ours worked. Um, and everything I said that would go wrong went wrong. But I was dealing with a teacher that didn't know space. And he, you know, my partner and I did. But when you're dealing with an instructor, sometimes you have to play nice. And we did, and, and we were successful. Everybody was absolutely floored. They're like, holy cow, we can't believe this worked. And it did. Um, and my amateur radio license came in great because I, they noticed that we were wandering off 
And they're like, no, no, you need to come back. We're over here. So it was, you know, some great learning experiences. And so when I finally got to the point where I'm ready to start teaching, uh, that's where my disabilities finally sidelined me. Um, I just couldn't do it. And then um, 2016, I had a meds induced seizure. Um, so that put me down. And my dad had always been pushing me, you know, you need to do, do something with this. You need to do something with this. Um, don't give up. You can still do stuff. And I lost my dad in 2017. And that was, uh, that was rough. Uh, it's, we're still dealing with his estate almost five years later. And that's, that's really hard on me. Um, and so a friend of mine who I worked with here in Colorado Springs, um, he and I were talking. And so we decided that, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna do what dad suggested. We're gonna write a book. And we initially, when we set out, we said, it's gonna, we can do this in a year, no problem. There, there but for the grace of God go, the idiot that had no idea what he was stepping into. Um, that was almost five years ago. I've been to three space symposiums since, and the one this year got canceled. Well, rescheduled, I should say, uh, to October. And uh, we got the opportunity to interview uh, Charlie Duke, uh, Apollo 16. And that was an amazing experience. Um, Charlie, as you may not know, Charlie was Air Force. The Air Force at that point in time was 25 years old. Hmm. So being retired Air Force and Chris, my, my buddy, is also retired Air Force. So being able to talk to Charlie in that and um, uh, see kind of, you know, insight and, and talk with him. And theirs was me, basically all geology and and. You know, I've had several geology classes. I've, I've got over 240 credit hours of, of schooling. Um, I, I actually found out that, that once you get past 180 hours of credits, they pull your funding. I didn't know that. So that was a unique uh, learning experience. So being able to do that was really cool. Um, I came across, there's there's a wonderful book, so I'm, I'm still... There's still a teacher in me. So I've got the, the um, space mathematics book that um, there, there's some great stuff in here. And I actually, um, was it last year or a year before, um, they, they had a, uh, um, an award winner that gave me another book. And one of the big things he pushes is don't limit the kids to the paradigm. So I went, okay. So there's an exercise in this book that talks about using, looking at the errors of putting numbers into binary formats. So basically when you put five in, it's actually, it's not five, there's, there's some errors in calculating the errors and, and, and looking at that. And I went, okay, you know, at the time my son was a sophomore and I had a second grader and I went, let's really reach and see if I can do a one room classroom lesson that covers both of them, both my kids. The worst I'm going to do is screw up my kids. I can take this risk. And it worked. And I went, holy cow. Um, I'm trying to think if I've got, I know I've got that book on my, I'm looking over at my, uh, I, I've got, there, there are some people that, that are into, you know, collecting things. I collect books. <laughs> I've got every book that, that I have from school. I got books on geology, on amateur radio, on space. And so he gave me a book. And let me grab it real quick because I think I know where it is. Um, yes. And they use this at their school. It's called the Study Handbook. Hmm. And so it's principles and techniques for effective learning, and it's from the works of L. Ron Hubbard, which initially made me a little nervous. 
and um, he signed it for me, which I thought was really cool. Oh, wow. And uh, he works at the, the uh, it's Diego Martinez. And I realized that the lighting is not helping here. Oh, come on, your lights. Okay. Diego Martinez, he was um, the 2018 Allard Sh Alan Shepard Award winner. Oh, wow. Um, the the uh, 2020, oh, is that no, the 2019 Alan Shepard Award winner uh, actually came from uh, uh, Space Center Houston, uh, does their college program, and, and spoke uh, Casey Hines. I don't know if you've heard yes. her. Yes, yes. I remember her talking, and honestly, when she was doing her, her thing, I wasn't sure she was going to be okay because she she kept breaking down all the way through. <laughs> I, I remember that one. That was that was very cool. Um, Phoebe and I went to that um, last year, and that was that was really cool to see that. And I really enjoy seeing the teaching ones because. I got introduced to the space symposium because of another teacher that I did my student teaching time with. And so that's, that was the other thing was that when I got involved with that, and then I was able to, at the last minute, you know, my dad passed in January and I went, screw it, let's see if we can get into the space symposium. And then that worked out beautifully and we were able to work that. And I was just like, wow. And so, I managed to Shanghai some time with Diego to, to talk with him a little bit. And I was just like, wow. And, and so that, that has evolved into a portion of my book that, that I never even expected to write because the way we're doing school doesn't work as evidenced by everything going on now, because I'm doing a lot of homeschooling with my youngest and my 18 year old who's now in school, community college is, discovering that's not working real well. And so you're, you're finding things that do work that don't work. And I'm just, I'm frustrated by some of that because it's like, we're not, we shouldn't be teaching to the lowest common denominator. We should be teaching to the highest and then letting them grab what they can grab and then just hitting these things repeatedly. And this is, this goes back to there's so much of our education system that's based on our agrarian society. The reason why we have a summer break, because that's when you had to work the fields. Why does school not start till after Labor Day? Well, I mean, now we're starting to push that back, but it didn't start till after Labor Day because that's when the harvest started. And I probably wouldn't know some of these things, except for I used to go up to my uh, uh, grandfather's farm and, and help with these things. So I've got some idea of some experience working the farm, you know, hay bales, you know, tilling, mowing. These are these are experiences I've had and, and are, they're, they're not mainstream. I mean, a lot of the experiences I've, I've come to find are not mainstream. And that is not. Um, that is not a bad thing. I'm, I'm discovered that a lot of students don't have the cultural experiences um, to understand this. And, and this, trying to explain this is, is the other thing because I'm, I'm trying to write my book for sixth graders. Um, and so I, I also recognize that there are times where I don't explain things well. And so Chris has been really good at, at trying to, to help me with that. Um, and one of the other challenges I have to work at now is, um, you know, I'm 100% I'm disabled that there are things I just cannot do that I used to be able to do 30 years ago. Uh, with the seizure, I've got short-term memory loss. So there are things that I have problems with with that. So I have to write notes having people help me with things that's helpful. Um, I've got notes. I, I, you know, when I'm on a streak, I'm on a streak and I've got notebooks where I will have just started writing something and, and away we go. Um, 
but there will be things where I will be like, okay, yeah, this is important. That's important. Trying to, to talk about um, things that, that are, are key to teach people. Like right now, um, there, are, there are things that we, that I will, and I have to watch this on Twitter because I will see things really just, I'm like, that's wrong. No, we can't do that. I have to sometimes reel myself back and go, okay, no, that that's, I need to pull back from that. I, I just, uh, there was a, a, a Twitter thing that, that I, I kind of had to, to really kind of watch a little bit because I didn't want to stomp on anybody's toes, but at the same time I needed to point out, um, there was a need to remember Locke. And I don't know how familiar you are with Locke. Um, he's a... Oh, the philosopher. He was a philosopher, and I'm trying to remember if it was 1600s or 1700s. I, I may be wrong on my era. Yeah, I want to say 1600s, but okay. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll like trust so. your memory more than mine. Um, I, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I actually, there's a site that you can go out, you can download some of these as audiobooks. Um, and I've been listening to them, and that's been helpful because you're getting a lot of people pushing agendas. And that was the other thing I've noticed. Because, like, if you look at some of the reporting that's going on, and we're seeing this in Colorado, our governor's been doing it. Mm -hmm. There are things that are being said and done that are not okay. He got caught because if you died and you tested positive for COVID, but you were killed in a car accident, the cause of death was listed as COVID. He got hammered for that. Hmm. The cause of death was the car accident, and it should have been listed as such. COVID didn't cause you to drive into the barrier or to get t-boned by the other vehicle i'm sorry that that's that should have been a no-brainer that's there are financial reasons why people are getting labeled for that that's a money grab and that really pisses me off that that that's politics and that that's that's something i really i never thought i'd be writing a book about space law because i i hated politics um and this actually, my dad had read a paper that I wrote in my top politics class that was on space law. And he said, you really should do something with this. And so that was kind of, you know, that paper is kind of where we jump started from with this. But going back to Locke, Locke says, you have things in the common, but humans use things. And so her big thing with her paper or her, her uh, TED talk the problem with the TED talk is everybody takes that as gospel. That's dangerous. And with a TED talk, she's saying everything in space you can't appropriate. Well, I'm also a scuba diver. And so my analogy is then I challenge you to go take a 20 foot depth dive for 45 minutes and not appropriate any of my common air. You won't survive the dive. We cannot survive in space without appropriating resources. We have to appropriate water. The, the, the rule of threes, which you, I, I'm guessing you're familiar with, three minutes without air, oh. three, three days without water, three weeks without food. Hmm. I haven't heard it put so succinctly before. Okay. Um, it comes up that it actually made it into the latest edition of Savage Worlds. It's a role-playing game system that I like. Um, and the, the rule of threes does, does come across. Although I don't know too many people that can hold their breath for three minutes. So I always say it's, it's an estimation because you get some people that, yeah, three minutes without air uh have that and you got a better estimation but you you have to accept that um 
one of the other things I came across that, that I just find absolutely hilarious, no weapons testing on the moon. Well, there's actually much better than, than here on earth probably. Well, but here's the problem. It sounds great. And, and you go back to Machiavelli, good works will do you harm. And I actually, Mrs. K will love this. God, God rest her soul that, that I remember this from her class, but she, she taught us Machiavelli and, and I got a kick out of that. Um, Machiavelli says that, and you got to watch that because this is one of those times where good works will do you harm because here's the problem. 1896, there was a, a Supreme Court decision that said even rocks count as deadly weapons. And that, so that's also have, been the, the plot of several sci-fi movies, putting a, a rail gun on the, uh, you know, uh, some type of um, accelerating thing and asteroids. And I mean, like the moon is a harsh mistress by Robert Heinlein. That's like how they still held haven't the, gotten to read that. Yeah. Yeah. I think you'd enjoy it. I, I would. I, I keep going. I need to put that on my list of books to read. I, I still I still haven't gotten to it. Uh, I'm, I'm running out of read time, um, especially with my son. It's, it's yeah, my, my reading schedule. I finally had to return a whole bunch of books. The Air Force Academy said, um, you've had these books since January. We really like them back. You know, COVID's kind of over now as far as we're concerned. We really like them back. And I'm like, I haven't gotten to read them all yet. Can I get, no, okay, fine, I'll give them back. <laughs> But, but that, that's kind of the thing, because like I took an archaeology of Colorado class, and one of the things we did was flint napping, making arrowheads out of obsidian. There's obsidian on the moon. I can literally pick up a rock, make myself an arrowhead using compressed gas and a rod. I can literally, we can go Stone Age here, and you know I'm from Wyoming. We're not running them off of, you know, giant cliffs to kill the, the massive bison. I can I can run them through. In fact, there's a, a, a event that, that they hold up in Wyoming where they've actually got a massive buffalo and you get to use your atlatl to throw your spears, a massive buffalo, hmm. the, the mastodon and, and that. And so I look at that and I go, their, their attempt is to create a weapons free environment but you've got rocks you've got places you can shove somebody off a cliff all i have to do is break a faceplate and they're dead you you cannot it's like trying to create a gun free zone and there's actually there's a report that the uh, secret service did you are more likely to die in a gun free zone than anywhere else and I just died when I read the paper because I'm like, literally, it says entering a gun free zone means you, your chance of dying goes up. And I just I just died laughing at that point. The statistics, you know, they, they, they say things because where are most people dying? They're dying in gun free zones because people don't have the ability to defend themselves. It's it's leading to a false sense of security. And I think that's what's going to happen because. Um, what happens, and, and this is actually something I've, I've been thinking about trying to write this up, but I just haven't decided if I can get it down to the 3,000 word paper they want it. NASA right now has a contract out. They're saying, we will pay for moon rocks. So I've got this gorgeous rock that's got all sorts of stuff, and I'm going to sell it to NASA. And I mark out on the ground. And um, have you ever read Little House on the Prairie, any of the Laura Ingalls Wilder series? I have not. Okay. Um, my mom made me read those growing up. So I, I read the whole series that she wrote from Little House in the Big Woods all the way to the very end. Um, it's a slog. <laughs> but they actually talk about when they opened up Kansas, I think it was. And there was a shotgun blast and you raced across the river and you had pegs and you put your pegs in the ground and that marked out your territory. And there were shotgun blasts, and rifle blasts. And if your pegs overlap this other person's pegs and you had to sort it out and people getting shot because I claimed that land and people going over early. There's so a 
Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman went about a similar thing in Oklahoma. Uh, free and away, I think is what it's called or something like that. Would not surprise me because I think the same thing happened there. The whole idea is when you open up a new territory like that, what happens when the territory I claim, somebody else decides they're going to claim, and this happens in Wyoming, because we had the ranch wars in Wyoming. Um, Wyoming history is actually mandated what if you teach in Wyoming, or if, you know, for us, fourth grade, we had the little blue book or the little violet book, and literally range wars and fence wars was a part of Wyoming history for 50, 100 years, it still happens. Fence wars, you still get people shot over fences. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a scary thing. So what happens when somebody decides that's my piece of land, I already bought it 20 years ago from the guy that's actually selling chunks of the moon because there's a guy that that actually says he owns the moon mars jupiter or not jupiter um one of the moons of jupiter um well it's nice to know he has some limits oh yeah he didn't take everything and he actually he was really good because he marked out certain areas said these you cannot buy these areas you're only allowed to buy up certain amounts he's actually set up a government with this and we talked to him the very first year and um, with everything that's been going on, I haven't gotten back in touch with him, but here's the cool part. He's actually negotiating with the International Monetary Fund to release a monetary unit called the Delta. And if he actually can make that happen, that's scary because at that point, then they may actually have to say part of the moon is owned already and he's actually got presidents to buy into this he's got part of the russians to buy into this i mean we're not talking this isn't just you know i get a little cool piece of paper that says i own part of the moon there's actually some legitimacy to this guy so well maybe you get me in touch with him i uh like to hear what his views are about us going back to the moon and <laughs> there, there are a lot of very interesting questions and and i have I, I need to look back up his information because he had some really neat ideas and he has stepped very cautiously around things that will get him in trouble with the Outer Space Treaty. Um, it really surprised me. And I, I know there's a couple of people that, that um, got very upset over the idea of uh, you can't build a military facility on the moon. I said, no, you can build whatever you want on the moon. You just can't call it a military facility, which of course then everybody gets upset and goes, oh, well, it's still a military facility. I said, you can use military personnel. We've been using military personnel. In fact, every person that's been on the moon was a military member. Technically, we invaded the moon, we sent troops, we landed troops, and we called them back. That can be a way to describe it. And this goes back to how you say it, how you phrase it, how you characterize it matters immensely. Mm. And this is one of the things that bothers me the most about how things are presented, especially like you think about how we present Indian Wars, the Indian narrative. Um, I, I still am amazed at like looking at the Louisiana Purchase. We bought the Louisiana Purchase, but then we paid for the Louisiana Purchase several times over by negotiating sometimes for the same piece of land with five different Indian tribes. Hmm. That, that just blows my mind. How, how does that work? Um, the other piece that just really blows my mind is the idea that no weapons in space, a rocket ship or a satellite is a kinetic weapon in space, period. Uh, an oxygen cylinder, I mean, we, we all saw Jumanji, we, we've all seen the proverbial, you know, air tank, I knock the end off the air tank, I've got a missile. Sure. It, it, there you go. It's an amazing 
projectile. It's, it's unguided, but with a little bit of work, I can make it guided. And that, that's the piece where people are not necessarily thinking about this. They're not recognizing that we've already weaponized space. We just don't call it weaponizing space. They don't recognize it. It's like people go guns kill people. No, people kill people. If you really want to talk about things that are killing people, let's talk about cars because the number of firearms related incidents I responded to as an EMT was zero. The number of car accidents I responded to on a really exciting day, I got up to five. Mm. And that's when we got sheets of ice hitting Omaha and, um, it was just from this accident to this accident to this accident to this accident to this accident to, oh my God, I'm so exhausted and so cold and wet. I need to go home and warm up and take a warm shower. So, you know. Uh, so uh, what do you think about uh, Space Force? We have needed that for a while. Um, I am severely frustrated by some of what's going on with that because they should have gotten the trademark situation worked out long before they ever put it out there. The you're moment they about, said- You're talking about with the emblem and uh, Star Trek? Uh, with the actual Netflix series. Oh, the Netflix, oh. Because Netflix actually has priority on the name space force wow yeah that that was that was bad they, they really they they fumbled the ball on that um i i still agree with the the uh, uh, uh cso on that one i had to stop and think about what his title is now um because when it first came out, they actually, I was on the, uh, the conference call with them and, and one of the reporters asked him, what do you think about it? And they, they, were, they were doing what reporters do. They were fishing and trying to you know, get a condemnation out of it. And his response is, yeah, I watched it. I think he needs a haircut. And I just died laughing. I'm like, that's perfect. Yeah. And he does need a haircut. No, it's not in, in Rex. Um, and I still find that hilarious because this is the longest my hair's been. I haven't been to see the barber in a while and I, I need to go get a haircut. And what's funny is I've got a, my scuba ID. I've got hair down almost to my shoulders and I can't even get it. I mean, this drives me nuts. I need to go get a haircut. And I've been retired for about 20 years now. And it's just, there are things that are, are ingrained in you that, that there's a certain level of okayness. Having watched the series, um, all the way through, there are some things that I find hilarious and having worked on one side of it, having seen how Noah handled things, how very poorly they handled things. And the piece that really irritates me, I mean, DMSP is a sore spot with me because they took a very nice program that was well done and they scrapped it, made such a mess of it. And then they handed it back to the military and went, um, we screwed it up. It's your program now. And destroyed it. They destroyed a military capability we desperately needed. And you um, said it was a DMSP? Yeah, Defense Meteorological Satellite Program. Okay. Um, we had two multi-million dollar facilities, one of which was nuclear hardened. They built two brand new facilities, neither of which was nuclear hardened. Um, we made them as a condition, we made them build out all the satellites, um, the next block of satellites. They would not have gotten their next launch off if I had not gone out and helped them with their uh, simulator. If I had not been available to them, they would not have launched on time. They almost fried the simulator here in Colorado Springs and the one in Suitland, Maryland. Uh, because of a bad software load. I caught it and basically we got to the point where Colorado Springs, who is supposed to be subordinate to NOAA, basically told NOAA, until Aaron says to load it, we will not load it. It was that bad. 
Um, I actually got a, uh, a achievement medal for my services rendered, even though that was not part of my job description. I was supposed mm -hmm. to be working space weather, not DMSP. Um, it is horrendous. They actually, they were supposed to be working on the next set of satellites and they've so, so screwed it up that now we're sitting here going, now what? And it's compromising flight ops because we basically, our satellites gave us the ability to go to plan missions to tell us where not to drive tanks. Don't drive tanks through there, the ground's sop, sopping wet. You're gonna, you know. Bog down. Exactly. Basically, the, the argument is DMSP was mud to sun. And it's, it's amazing what we had, had developed. The, the piece I also think that factors into this, they got bids from contractors to build the program out in the 60s. The original people that did DMSP said, that's way too expensive, we can do it cheaper. They did it for one third of the cost. And I think half the time, if I remember my numbers right, by doing it in-house blue suit development only. Mm. And I think that rankles a lot of contractors because we were an example of how to do it right. And on more than a couple of occasions, we held blue suit or, or, or contractors, we held their feet to their fire. In fact, I was one of the people that actually pissed off a number of contractors because I basically told them, you're going to do it this way because I am the government rep and I say so. And I was a senior airman at the time, which is an E-4, which basically E-4s, E-4s scrub hallways. They, they mop, they dust. Um, E-4s do not tell people what to do is, is the way most contractors view the world. Uh, that's not the way six ops did things. When an E-4 says jump to a contractor, the contractor says how high. I made them deliver a functional good piece of software that worked that did the mission mission mm -hmm. comes first that's all that matters and that was very important and for them to demolish the program the way they did it really really pisses me off um, especially for politics reasons um, they tried to do the same thing to gps but they couldn't quite make it work there wasn't the depth the other thing is there were three studies done. Out of those three studies, the first study said, no, keep them separate. Separate. The second study said, no, no, it's so screwed up. Give no to the military and let them do that. Of course, everybody freaked out. Third study said, no, keep them separate. And then Gore and Clinton both said, oh, we're going to ignore all of that because you guys are all just a bunch of idiots and we know better than the military. Mm. And... To give you an idea how bad it got, Clinton came to visit off at Air Force Base where Six Ops was. The only reason why I know this is because I put in for time off to go to an EMS instructors conference. I put in my leave paperwork three months in advance because it was permissive TDY, which basically means I don't get charged leave because um, it benefits the military because I was also teaching for the, the base hospital. I was, you know, I, I was I was doing a lot of other things with with, with that teaching cert. Um, my leave got canceled, and so when I started screaming about it, I come to find out that the moment that they found out Clinton was coming to the base, the entire base put in like ninety seven percent of the base put in for leave for that day. So basically, Clinton was going to find the entire base was a ghost town when he showed up. Hmm. Base commander wants to get promoted, wants his next star. He can't have that. All the leaves got canceled. That's the only reason why I know about it. So I, of course, fought it, got it reinstated. I got to go on my leave. Everybody else got their leaves canceled. So it was not a positive morale building experience. Um, it, it was it was politicking and looking at how DMSP was lined up for the chopping block and, and everything. The last pass taken out of six SOPs 
would have seen any other person, um, any other military flight crew with Article 15s. Uh, it was a failed pass, and they scored it as nominal, which was truly scary to see. And it suffered badly. So th those are the two, two ways I see things in, in the satellite world. You, is you see those extremes when somebody goes, oh my God, it's military. No, it's, it's not quite that cut and dry. Military, there's, there's a certain level of, of we, we see a mission as, as important and it should be done a certain way because lives depend on it. Other people see it as, oh, military, that must mean bad because you kill people and break things to quote a admiral. And yes, that is a mission. That is not the only mission. And there are some places where the only weather satellites we had were DMSP. And I think that's, that's very important. So to lose such a important capability um, and to see it mismanaged, because I also think that uh, the one, uh, there was actually one debris event where we had a battery explode. Mm. I think that comes back to uh, mismanagement of the satellites on orbit. Because I don't remember us having satellites with exploding batteries. I think we did a much better job of managing the satellite fleet. So again, I think this just goes back to people that care, people that, that do a good job. If you truly care, it matters. And if you don't care and you're just there because you get a nice GS paycheck, and I've had some run-ins with some GSs that they're just there for the paycheck, this is a problem. So as you can tell, this is kind of a hot button for me. So I apologize for my soapbox. <laughs> No worries. I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the Challenger. Um, I, first off, did you see the Netflix documentary? I started it and my son got kind of upset watching it. So I had to shut it off. I have not gotten to go back and watch it all the way yet. I do want to see it. Um, there were a lot of things about that that, um, that bother me. In fact, I was just talking with Drone Deploy. I don't know if you're familiar with them. No. Um, one of the things that they want to do is like they, they have the idea is using drones to go out and look at a construction site and look and say, is this correct? Taking pictures, doing time lapses, are, are things moving the right way? Doing, um, okay, we have, do we have the right number of pieces in place? Is somebody stealing things? Are, things in the right place? Did we use the right amount of cement? Did we put things in the right place? Are things going up in the right time? Um, are things on scale, on time, on budget? Um, doing, going out to your power lines, doing surveys on your power lines, um, things like that. You know, the in, uh, inventory and assess the state of your infrastructure. I had a conversation with them about space and doing that for being able to go out and using FLIR, look at and do a, you know, 360 all the way up as a, you know, personally, I'd like to do a double helix because if you had two of them, you could actually do x-ray and actually look through and you would actually be able to see faults. Um, I am apparently light years away in or galaxies. So way, way beyond anything they're even considering. Um, they're also using drones for forest fires and emergency management. Uh, this is something that I'm, you know, obviously it's fire. Uh, anything to do with fire, I'm very interested in. So going back to Challenger, what if we had, you know, obviously drones, we didn't have drones that were even close to this capable back then, at least in an unclassified world that I would know about. Um, and at that point, I was a kid. So if they were classified, I, I don't want you reading anything into that statement. I just realized 
crap, I don't want you to read anything, but maybe I, we had them and I knew about it or something. No, my, my limited experience with classified is nothing spectacular. So, but the idea of what if you could actually look at something and see that damage before the booster was even fueled to recognize that there was damage before the booster even lifted. That is a light year jump that would be possible with drones. The ability to look and see that this is damaged. The other thing, and this goes back to something SpaceX is doing, the ability to do abort at any time in the launch, um, that's important. Now, I still had the Challenger crew known what was going on, I still maintain Challenger could have gotten off that stack. There are some that still say I'm full of shit. But again, here's the catch. You have to have the data. You have to recognize the data. And you have to decide that it's important and you have to act on it. And they had to recognize, they had to, to have the data, recognize it, and they did have the data. And it did come out, there was a pressure drop in the stack, but they did not recognize the significance. And that was the catch. Um, to give you a, a better example of why we're having problems like this, we have lost, several aircraft as of late. We lost an F-35 down in Eglin. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No, when did that happen? Uh, that happened, I think, a couple of months ago. The uh, accident report just came out on it. The uh, Airborne, in, or the Accident Investigation Board, AIB. Um, basically, what happened was it got a... It overran the processor's ability to function because it was changing modes so fast between the wheels um, on ground mode, bounce mode, landing mode, and then the pilot had a, a helmet off center uh, cue out of alignment mode with his helmet, and they were doing this at night, and then he made a couple of mistakes and he did a couple of things he shouldn't have done. And then he went back to, well, in an F-15, this is what I would do. So this is the danger of new training versus retraining somebody. Hmm. And he put the aircraft down. It didn't come down on its back landing gear and rotate to the front. He put it down in a three-point landing, which because they're so nose light, it bounced the front up, which then created pilot-induced oscillations. Um, when he finally decided he wanted to abort, he put full afterburner and hauled back on the stick, held that for three seconds. The aircraft failed to respond because it was basically, it was locked out with all the various inputs that he'd been putting into it. And it was like, I don't know what to do. And at that point he went, you know what? I really need to get the hell out of my aircraft because this aircraft's going to go crazy because it's not responding to my inputs. Immediately ejects, aircraft goes off the runway, tumbles, and we're out 1.75 mil. Hmm. Not a good environment. Here's the bad part. Nobody from maintenance all the way up could figure out what the hell happened. Nobody knew it was changing through that many modes during that time frame. And for him to have all the problems that he had, they all happened at the worst possible time. So basically, you had a perfect storm of events. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to the idea that we're not flying aircraft made in the 70s that are, you know, they're not fly by wire. wire. These are actually, we're making joystick inputs to computers, computers flying the aircraft, because these are inherently unstable aircraft. Right. And Challenger is a flyby computer aircraft. Well, was, I should say, but all of the space shuttles as a fleet. It's five computers that vote. And 
as fast as they are, here's the scary part. These are the same computers that fly the B1, the bombers. Wow. And I didn't know that until recently. But when you've got computers, you've got to worry about race conditions. I used to test software. So one of the first things I do is what is the absolute worst thing I can do? So one of the projects I'm most proud of uh, was working solar flares. We were mm -hmm. supposed to do an event where it basically goes out and it says, um, we take in this event. And I basically said, we go to X20, which is like the worst event we could have. Shortly after I got out, 2003, we had the Halloween storms of 2003. That was the, the thing that became the basis for my senior seminar project. And I know my software worked because I tested it to that level. That's pretty awesome. It is. But nobody wanted to test it to that high because they said it's never going to go that high. Never Within two years, me being out, it went that high. Um, never, I, ever do that. <laughs> I, I kind of want to get your thoughts on um, kind of where you think. Well, first of all, what do you think about a return to the moon in 2024? We should have gone back a hell of a lot sooner. And the reasons we didn't go back, as Charlie Duke put it, are the Armstrong cur curves never lined up. Um, so don't think that the Armstrong curves are anything that I came up with or, or that they're anything. There's something I learned about because I'd never even heard of them until I talked to Charlie. And um, I cannot for the life of me remember his flight controller that came up with him. Um, they had a... Um, it's on, I put it on the website. It's been so long. Uh, they were doing a, a thing talking about Apollo. It was a movie. And it's actually, it's, it's really good. It, it was out on iTunes. Um, crap, I cannot remember the name of the movie. I'm going to have to look it up now. Um, but basically the Armstrong curves, you got to have the public support. You've got to have the financial support. You've got to have the political support. And you really, we haven't had it. And that's what really has always been frustrating is that we've never had it since we went to the moon. And that was just because the Russians were doing it. And we were tired of getting beat by the Russians. And I, I find that irritating and a very unworthy statement. We should have gone back long before then. In fact, I actually wanted to be an astronaut. In, in retrospect, given some of the problems that I've run into, I have a, a condition um, with orthostatic shock when my blood pressure crashes. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, I would have never passed the, the flight physical. Um, that doesn't mean I still don't want to go, but I have medical conditions now that, that make it such that um, I would be the, the last person that, that, as they would have said during World War II, 4F, <laughs> well, not um, going. So it, it sounds like that, like, um, you know, taking a Dragon capsule ride to ISS would, would be problematic for you. But um, have you heard of uh, Space Perspective? It's a company... Um, you know, by Jane Pointer and uh, Taber McAuliffe. They were, they had a another company over there in um, Arizona, uh, Worldview, and also, um, I mean, they were both actually in the the biosphere uh, way back at the end of the 1980s. Uh, but anyway, uh, Space Perspectives, uh, they're planning to have like this this huge. Um, hydrogen filled balloon carry nine people up to like a hundred thousand feet. I okay, that's why it sounds okay. I'm sitting here going, the name sounds familiar, but I couldn't place it. Um, I I've, I've got a lot of interest in ballooning too. Uh, of course, because of my meds, I can't get a flight license to fly it. I can't get a balloon license to balloon because basically you have to pass the same qualifications um oh, you'd be inside of a contained uh capsule you know so you would be, oh yeah because there's not enough air to not enough up. air to breathe yeah and it would be a space. you would be a passenger so and it should be very gentle 
Oh yeah, yeah. It would still be. It would be. It would be interesting to do that kind of stuff. But unfortunately, my resources probably wouldn't be such that I could do that. Um, I would love to do that. Um, my wife would have kittens, of course. Um, I think that those types of things are awesome. And I think we need to do more of that because there are things that can be done at the edge of space that tell us a lot. There's, there's radiation experiments. There's things that we don't understand about the high altitude, ways that space interacts with our planet. Um, there's radiation hitting the upper atmosphere all the time. Our terrestrial weather is driven by this. Our La Nina, El Nino cycles, the number of major storm systems that are generated each year are derived from space events. Um, lightning storms, there, there's a lot of that stuff up there that we need to study and Honestly, I'd like to see a, a more permanent, long-term presence up there. Um, there is, however, a legal problem to this. There is a question about overflight. You remember the U-2 missions? Mm -hmm. um, Gary Powers. There, there is a regime in there, and this is why we actually need a boundary for space. Some people want the Carmen line, some people don't want the Carmen line, some people want 100,000, some people want this, some people want that. You know, if we actually have a designator and say above this is not your territory, airspace ends at this altitude, that would be enormously helpful. Um, there's actually a book that talks about this that was written back in the 20s and 30s. Um, is it Gala, I think is her name or his name? Hungarian author. And, and I got it. And it actually talks about used to be your airspace was defined by how high you could shoot a gun. Hmm. Literally, that defined your, your airspace. Whatever you could intercept was your airspace. And to a very large extent, weaponry has defined our airspace. My ability to shoot somebody down defines my ability to control it. Gary Powers, we said, we can fly over your airspace and you can't stop us. The Russians went, no, this is our airspace. We will control it. Bang. See, we controlled it. And we went, okay, we won't fly over your airspace anymore. But then Eisenhower said the very first thing he launched was not a military satellite, which the military wanted to do. It was a civilian because if it was civilian, it guaranteed the right of civilian overflight. And because we didn't shoot down Sputnik, the Russians couldn't shoot down ours because both of them were civilian. It established the right of peaceful overflight. However, and this is the interesting point, there is no guaranteed right of peaceful overflight for military spacecraft. Mm. And so these are the interesting little nuances. And this is why space law, space law is this interesting mess of spaghetti that has evolved out and makes absolutely no sense. Absolutely. It, it, I mean, you remember after the uh, Falcon Heavy test flight, um, you know, they had those great views with Starman and the, the Tesla and the Earth in the background. And then the, first, the few flights after that, uh, uh, you know, SpaceX didn't show, uh, you know, like pictures of the Earth or in orbit things saying that they didn't have the, the right license or what have you. And, you know, there's some stuff about, um, you know, the, the, the launching state having to control or get permission by any like states that they give, you know, pictures of, I mean, there's, it was something, something like that. So. It was bullshit politics, pardon my French, but that's what it was. It was somebody deciding you can't do this because we don't think SpaceX should have the right to do this, even though they were letting everybody else do it, even though other companies were doing it, even though those were not the only ones. But I also understand some of what they're saying because DMSP flight data was classified for 24 hours because 
it provides a certain amount of weapons level targeting data. And this is the problem is that if you know enough, you can provide some really interesting stuff. And that really bothers me that there are people that do really stupid stuff that just you're like, guys, really, you guys are going to do this. And you get some groups that go, you know what? I can do targeting if I go buy it from this person. And these are the reasons why we have really goofy groups that do things and we have to protect ourselves. And it's like, if you follow the little piece of spaghetti through all the loops, you understand how you got there. It still doesn't make any sense. It's still stupid, but you understand how you got there and you, you scratch your head immensely. I, I still find it hilarious. Like there are people going, well, but, but why isn't the camera still working on the Tesla vehicle? It's like, Really? You expected them to load it up to, to run for 500 years so you could see pictures of what, black? I mean, it's not, it was a publicity stunt. They did it. Get over it. I had really uh, awakened a lot of people to space is actually happening. And what a cool image, at least. It was. I think it was one of the best things they, they could have done. And the biggest problem that we're running into is you've got the the old guys on the block or the, the, the new kids on the block and, and the old guys. You, you've got Boeing and, and all those guys that say, this is how space should be done. And then you've got the new guys that are showing up and that are innovative. And SpaceX is innovative. Well, and, and you know, like, I think you, it may not just be old guys, new guys. I think it's also uh, corporate objectives. Uh, Boeing and Lockheed um, make more money uh, the less they fly. <laughs> they do. And what did you notice about the one Air Force contract that Boeing won? They went through competing, all this stuff, all this stuff. They, they beat out SpaceX and, and uh, Blue Origin and everything. They won the contract. And then they told the Air Force, we refuse to perform. And the whole contract died. They competed for no other purpose than to keep somebody else from winning the contract. Wow. In my opinion, somebody should have beat them up one side down the other. Uh, unfortunately, it was dirty pool. And this comes back to writing good contracts where you basically say to them, if you win this contract and you fail to perform, Here's penalty clause. You get to pay us back for the entire cost of the contract. Mm -hmm. And because we didn't get what we expected out of this, you now get to pay us back for what we lost in time. Yep. And that's the only way to stop Boeing from doing this kind of stuff. Boeing is not helping space. Boeing is hurting space. Look at, look at their testing regime. Their lead astronaut yes. walked yeah. away on what he says was a personal issue uh, the um, uh, daughter's wedding is the latest I, I don't buy it no i do not buy it because you can slide the wedding you can slide the launch you can say i need this as a guaranteed date no i don't buy that what it is he's seeing the test reports he's seeing all the software defects cropping up and i have no doubt his daughter and his wife said, you can fly after somebody else proves this damn thing won't blow up and kill you because I'm not going to have the rest of my life uh, going because you just had to be the first asshole idiot in the capsule. Yeah. I, no, because I've also been there because you've, you've heard of the Black Forest Fire? The Black Forest Fire? Yeah, up here. Uh, oh, no, I haven't actually. Okay, so the Black Forest Fire was up here north of Colorado Springs. About 20 years ago, I happened to be on that fire department for a little bit, and I told them, this is the worst possible case you need to plan for. I laid it all out at the fire board meeting. It was getting bad enough that my safety was being impacted 
by what they were not doing, not testing fire hose. Um, I actually showed up at a working fire and was ridiculed for stepping off the truck in a air pack with my mask on ready to fight fire. They then spent the next 20 minutes trying to figure out who the other idiot was going to go in with me and trying to get him dressed in a air pack. Hmm. Okay, th this is not safe. Th this is going to get somebody killed. My son, my oldest son, who is 12 at the time, and my wife, uh, so this is before my other two were born, begged me to quit the fire department. Yeah. Black Forest Fire shows up 2018, I want to say. Mm -hmm. Killed two people. Everything wow. I said would happen, happened. All the problems they had, everything I told them, they were not prepared for water supply, tankers, um, the I idea that they're, they are in a un, you know, no hydrants, they're going to have to have water coming in, they needed a plan, they had almost 20 years to plan for this event. They failed to plan and it cost lives. Uh, yeah, I, I, in that situation, based on what little I have seen and what I know of testing, right now the most expensive software defect is Arian 5 first launch. Are, are you familiar with that software defect? Uh, I'm always familiar with the, uh, oh, the Arian 5 first launch. No, I don't remember that. Okay, so Arian 5 first launch, they reused the Arian 4 software. Problem was bigger rocket engines, hmm. which means it goes up faster. Right. That also means it goes sideways faster. Hmm. So when your lateral counter goes out of range because you're only using this much space, this many bytes, and you actually need this many bytes. So when you get a overrun error, it goes, I'm going sideways too fast. And the only reason I could be going sideways too fast, according to the programmer, is because I'm pointed sideways and I'm obviously out of control. Mill thousands of a second, if, I, if I've got my numbers right, before the software was supposed to turn off, it commanded the rocket to self-destruct. Wow. For want of a couple of bits. This is why you do an end-to-end -end test. They did not do an end-to-end -end test. Yep. This is why end-to-end -end testing is so important. That is the well, most expensive software defect. And then last December, uh, you know, the the time launch timer for the UALA rocket and the Boeing capsule. And that would have killed people. You notice SpaceX isn't having these problems. Why is that? Why is that? Because they do testing. Yeah. Uh, my testing binder has a picture of the Grim Reaper with an arm over a programmer, and it says, in God we trust, all others bring data. <laughs> I was, they, they point what they knew when I was coming, they were asked, they said, well, what's going to happen when Aaron shows up here? Coming out here to Colorado Springs from Omaha, they said, well, he's going to wreak havoc. I, I, I was a walking nightmare. In fact, my favorite defect was had to do a DMSP. They were doing an upgrade to the system to handle the latest spacecraft. Um, but every 30 days, the data would go to hell. And they couldn't figure out why. And I went, well, the only thing I know that goes on a 30-day cycle is the moon. Every time there was a full moon, the data went to hell. Mm. I got laughed out of the room. I said, well, let me go prove the data. And I proved it. I proved, and I had to get down, and, and the data is tertiary compacted data, which means that every bit means a sensor. So we're talking getting into this is a nightmare. I, I mean, literally, it's this frame counts for like a tenth of a second. You go to the next frame, and this next frame means something completely different. I mean, it's, it's oh, dear God. It, it literally, it's a nightmare. And I was able to show that Global Weather Central in Omaha did a hardware software upgrade without telling anybody. And I did it when I showed the spacecraft going along in orbit and then all of a sudden dropping to a zero altitude. 
And then I said, and I told their, their guy, I said, now, as we're going to talk about the spacecraft here on another pass here in a second, I know the spacecraft's still flying. So it's your software. It's not my spacecraft. Mm -hmm. So you leave my spacecraft out of it and you leave my software out of it. It's you guys. When my friend Chris got stationed at, at uh, Global Weather, he got handed this exact problem to fix. And he went, oh, my God, you guys still haven't fixed this? Oh, no. <laughs> so that was one of my favorite projects that I just, everybody swore up and down that I was crazy. But I collected the data and I could prove it. And because I could go downstairs to six SOPs, the reserve unit at, at Schriever, and I could watch them take the pass. I could trace it through all the systems because I knew all the hardware. I knew how everything connected. I could watch it go through the decommutators and everything. I had it so well documented. There was no way anybody could tell me it was this or that or this or that. I knew all the data paths. They finally just held up their hands and went, yes, we made a hardware software change. I had them dead to rights. And it, it goes back to the systemology, understanding how the systems work. And if you can do that, to truly understand that, to be able to do a system test from end to end, that makes all the difference in the world. Boeing does not understand the system. SpaceX does. That's why SpaceX flew first. And that's why they're doing well. And it's not just their space division either. Um, you know, if they had pilots write their software for their 747, that may have saved a few people too. And this is the other problem is their, their 737 MAX stuff. Got that just, I, I mean, I've been following some of the software with that and that's just downright scary. Some of the stuff, some of the problems, but like then you go back to like, there was a, uh, yeah, back to my F-35, not my favorite aircraft, by the way. Um, they have a crash out by San Diego that just happened. It overflew the tanking aircraft, took out, there was an actual collision, took out the refueling pod on the, C, the C-130J, which was a marine aircraft, went through the pod, went through the two propellers, shattered the propellers, the C-130 sets down, there's damage to some of the propellers on the right side, so you've lost, you've got major damage, you've got fuel leaking, you've got, I have no doubt that there was fire, there had to have been fire at some point, you're leaking fuel like crazy, you're going down, you've lost 50% of the power at least, maybe more, and they set that aircraft down just short of the runway in a field, uh, wheels up. The, the fact that they set the aircraft down is amazing. There wow. is footage out there of that F-35 augering into the desert. Hmm. It, it was scary. And of course, there's the audio is out there of, of the whole thing. And uh, there is American Airlines flight coming north. They saw the impact. They saw the explosion. What they probably also saw was the pilot ejecting out of the F-35. Hmm. So, yeah, the F-35 isn't doing itself any favors, whereas I really the F-22 has some amazing capabilities. I really like that aircraft. But it's even got some problems because they also had somebody that did a pull back on the stick, retract the wheels, forgot he was at, at altitude, not at sea level, ran out of lift on the aircraft, and belly flopped at a Top Gun um, ceremony and skidded for like 600 feet hmm. or 6,000 feet. I'm sorry. I'm off on the zero there. And the skid marks, I'm just cringing because I'm like, you, you did that to an F-22. You, you, you need to be beaten. Uh, yeah. So the, the cool part about an F-22 is that if you shoot out one of its computers, it redistributes the load. So it's a very fault tolerant system and that's what we need. So we're not developing fault tolerant software and we're expecting that we're gonna go into space where everything's gonna go right. Apollo 13 guys, we, 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 nothing goes right. Nothing goes right in space. I'm sorry, if you expect a go right path, then you are going to get somebody killed. 
Um, uh, I've seen fire hose break on the fire ground. I know nothing survives the first encounter with the enemy, whether it's fire, whether it's space, whether it's the moon, things are going to go wrong and we are not prepared for it. And that's what worries me. So. Absolutely. And you were talking about the Armstrong curves and all the things that need to line up in order to uh, make it happen. Um, do you think those things are lining up for 2024 or do you feel like, um, you know, maybe we're just over optimistic? Okay, I'm going to have to step into politics here for a second. And I, I don't want to do that, but I'm going to have to. The one thing that Trump has done well, he has advocated for space. Whether you like him or, or hate him, he has done well by that. I also feel he is the closest thing to a third party candidate we could get into a two party system. That's a personal view. Okay. Uh, like him or hate him. Um, and I will tell you right now, having attended uh, the caucuses, nobody wanted him to win. Republicans or Democrats, nobody wanted him in. I was surprised that he actually made it into office. He has done more to help space and not just with lift service. He has done more to help space than any other president we've had. There's a part of me that wants to see him for a second term. But man, the guy has not done a lot of things right in a lot of other places. I also think that if we get Democrats in there, they are going to gut space. They are going to get NASA's budget. They're going to get a lot of other things because if I remember correctly, and this is where my memory may fail me, Eisenhower was a Republican, but I have yet to see a Democrat really, truly do well with space. Uh, Kennedy. Kennedy advocated it, but I have feeling that that was because that was a draw away from the race things that were going on in the world. Hmm. And I don't know if you've seen some of the stuff that there was actually, there was a race riot. Well, maybe not a riot, but there were protests. Let's, let's go with that. Riot has connotations that may not be appropriate. But there, there were protests at Cape Canaveral during the moon launches that we should not be spending money on space when we have so many problems to be solved down here. Mm. Here we are 60 years later, and you have the same people saying the exact same things again. That's true. My argument is... In 60 years, we have not really done space. Since Apollo died and Nixon and, and Ford, and, and let's be honest, Ford was the first non-elected president we've ever had. He got the job by appointment, not by election. Um, thank you, Nixon, for that. Uh, I really am bothered by that. I, I really, I'm afraid that uh, if Biden makes it in, he's going to get space. And I'm seeing a lot of things where people are doing and saying things that are not appropriate. They're, I have a real problem with people that are destroying fire trucks, that are assaulting firefighters that are destroying federal property because now we're going to turn around. We're going to have to throw money at that, those to replace those and rebuild those. Uh, my son and I go round and round on this topic. My son is biracial. Um, to be honest, he's technically my stepson, but I've raised him since he was eight. We do not see eye to eye on this. I think going to space will do more to help us than sitting here and trying to do some of the things that people are advocating here on the ground. You cannot fix 
the sins of the past to make up for it. Um, one of the things that bothers me the most is when somebody says, well, you're white, you got, you know, privileges. My grandmother is second generation immigrant. My wife is third generation Sicilian. So there, there's some things to be said there that, that I think agendas are being pushed. And I don't think reparations are the way to go because reparations just mean we gave you hush money. That, that doesn't fix anything. We tried that with the Japanese Americans and that didn't work well. And I've, I've researched, we have Camp Amache just south of uh, Pueblo, or I shouldn't say south, it's actually east of Pueblo on Highway 50. I still haven't been able to get down there with my kids, but I want my kids to see that because I want them to understand um, this is what happens when you start doing things along those lines. I think this is the pendulum swinging the other way. This is racism of a different sort. Mm. Um, yes, things happened, but you also need to look at what happened when we had our first black Air Force general who was a Tuskegee Airman. And when he went to go talk to some of these guys during the 60s, they called him a race trader, and he says, I'm here to talk to you. What it was is he didn't fit the argument they were trying to have. And that bothers me because that basically says we're going to control the discussion. We're going to control the argument. And if it doesn't fit the argument, we don't want to be a part of it. This is like the Sturgis argument about COVID. This is like the, uh, um, the other thing that's going on right now where Reddit and Twitter and Facebook are taking down things that don't fit the, well, we have to quarantine, we have to go into lockdown. If we don't do lockdown, there's no other option. You're getting epidemiologists saying there are other options. Uh, there are some people that can't wear masks and you're getting people that are literally getting beat up because they're Chinese, they're Asian, or they're not wearing a mask. You, got, you have a, a, a little girl that watched her dad get taken down by seven cops in Aurora because they were the only two in a field of, what, 23 acres, I think it was, up there. And none of the cops were wearing masks. Hmm. How is that helping? How is that safe? And you've traumatized a little girl who now believes her dad is going to be beaten to death by the cops. That, that's... This is that paradigm. This is not okay. You're not gonna fix this by putting a Democrat as president. And this goes back to the other thing, understanding and teaching how the system works. A president does not make all the decisions. It takes the legislative and the executive branches working together. And if they don't, things don't happen. President doesn't control how money's spent, it starts in the house, House has to fund, start every legend or financial bill, then goes to the Senate, and then goes to the president. That's three groups. Only one person in there, 435 other people have to make that happen, or a majority thereof in two groups. And people are missing that. And when you point it out to them, they all blow up and go nuclear and no, oh, we are just, and I'm like, dude, you got to understand how the system works. And if you don't believe how the system works, I'm not going to bother with the argument. And it's like, we're not teaching World War I anymore. We're not teaching things, but World War I, if you don't understand World War I, you don't understand why World War II happens. If you don't understand World War I, and the things that were put in place, you don't understand why the V-2 rocket was built. Right. And that's important because the v2 rocket is where the russians and the americans get their rocket aspirations and their Sputnik scientists was, exactly we got and, and for the longest time nobody knew that von braun was not american that was a very closely held secret so if it hadn't been for world war one when would rockets have shown up 
There's a very right. interesting question. I know we could still be thinking about trying to shoot people into space using big guns. Exactly. And all of this came out of science fiction in the 1900s and 1920s because the idea of orbiting the Earth didn't even come out until the 20s. Mm. That was science fiction. Yeah. So these are the things that really bother me about this. And this is the reason why I still say education is so important and why I've actually had some people tell me, well, you're not a lawyer. No, I'm not. But neither were the first colonials. None of them were attorneys either. Guess what? What's the difference between a lawyer and a non-lawyer? A little piece of paper. What's the difference between a physicist and a non-physicist? A little piece of paper. Somebody saying, oh, yeah, I think he's a lawyer. I think he's a physicist. Well, what's even worse is whenever you have the piece of paper but not the knowledge. And that is even more scary because there's actually some people saying, this is the way we need to go, and you're full of it. Because I was actually in the middle of that whole uh, uh, tardigrades, you know, the, the, uh, the water bear fiasco. Right. With, I was in the uh, middle of that when that was going back and forth on Twitter. And I kept advocating, saying, I want the facts. I want the information. Send me the facts. And they were ready to crucify. Granted, the way it came out, he was playing both sides down the middle. But I wanted the facts. I'm not prepared to crucify somebody without the facts. And they were ready to crucify him right then and there. And I said, no, I want the facts. I want the documents. I want to see what was actually done. And they crucified him. And I basically, I stood up in his defense and I went, no. We are so ready to crucify in social media right now. And that is so dangerous. And I, I've got a couple of uh, space lawyers that are very upset with me at the moment. Um, yeah, they're very powerful space lawyers. Yeah, what are you going to do? Sue me? Go for it, buddy. I, I'm worth basically nothing. What are you going to get out of me? I, I mean, that, that's kind of my, my attitude. And this is the point, is that when you, when you get people thinking that they can't have an opinion, that the only opinions that matter are those that are built on status, we have a real problem. Um, there, there's a great series. Uh, John Ringo is one of, one of my favorite authors, along with David Weber. So you can kind of guess some of my favorite books. Um, John Ringo wrote a, a series called uh, Troy Rising. Um, and, and one of his quotes is, is, I thought Cheops was insufficiently ambitious. And there are times where I think that we are insufficiently ambitious. Citadel is one of my favorite books. The idea that we're going to take an asteroid, inflate it, and turn it into a battle station with a kilometer of nickel iron as armor. I dare anybody to take that. Mm. You're not going to take it. And if I drop that on you, you're not going to be going, my toe, my toe. You're going to be going, I need a new, new home. I mean, these are the things that I'm sitting here going, people are just not thinking about this. People are going, you know, climate change. No, no, no. I haven't even started to change the climate. I bring an asteroid, inflate it, bring it in close opposite the moon. Oh, I can mess with the tides. I mean, you want to talk about weather modification? Oh, I can mess with it. Nobody's even talking about this. And they're going to argue you can't. Can't I? We've got some very effective uh, ionic thrusters. How, how much do I need to push to get it into a capture orbit? It, these are the things. I mean, it, it's, it's like it's insufficiently ambitious because we're thinking small. This is what I can do. No, I just need to think scale. And this is why the Chinese worry me is because they're going it alone. The Russians are already talking. They're going to take their space station pieces and go alone. When you get people doing things on their own, crazy things happen. And all it's going to take is somebody to recognize, I can bring an asteroid in here. And climate change, you ain't seen nothing. And personally, climate change, we've had climate change for the last 
six, 65 million plus years. Just look at the geologic record. So I, I laugh when we say climate change because it's been, it was never constant, never. The, the fact that we have such a short lifespan, it's constant for us. But over a large time frame, it's never been constant. But we don't teach geology. Now, um, I want to run an idea by you and get your perspective. I, I feel like the 2020s are going to be to space exploration what the 1990s were to the computer and internet. In 1990, you would have probably an easier time explaining to somebody what um, weightlessness was and free fall than you would email and websites. Uh, but then by um, 2000, you know, pretty much everybody has a computer at home. Almost everybody has dial up. Um, all major companies have websites. Uh, pretty much everybody has an email address and uh, people can buy books online. Um, you know, today, you know, space seems so um, niche and very, um, uh, you know, few people are traveling to space. But you know you have uh, Virgin Galactic's a public company. Maybe they'll actually start flying at some time soon. <laughs> and uh, you know you have like uh, SpaceX building the Starship down there in Boca Chica. I mean, what they're doing seems to be developing really fast. Elon Musk is talking about the same Starship being able to fly three times a day, having a factory in Boca Chica that's able to produce two of them per week. Uh, and you know, I mean, if he's able to even do one one hundredth of what he's talking about, that would probably be game changing, you know. Uh, and then you have uh, Blue Origin, who you know they have the new Shepard, they have all these contracts. I see people hiring all over. I see them hiring all over the place. You have these fourteen commercial lunar uh, commercial lunar payload services uh, companies. You have Rocket Lab. Um, you have uh, so much like going on. I mean, almost feels like. Um, so, I mean, I think by like 2030, this, this area of, will be completely transformed and uh, we will not, you know, things today that we say are impossible and likely someday uh, in 2030 will be going, of course, everybody's doing it. There's a catch in here, a very big catch. Um, a lot of the contracts and um, NASA General Counsel talked a lot to this right after Trump took uh, office. He basically, he pushed, I need NASA doing more to engage commercial entities. A lot of the money that SpaceX used to get started um, came from NASA. A lot of the money that all the startups are using came from the government. Now picture and cringe and have your nightmare if that fund is cut off. I mean, axed. Pelosi gets her way. She cuts it off. See, I'm cutting out Trump. They do exactly what they did when, uh, with Obamacare when, when Trump came in and, and just hammered Obamacare and, and basically just scrubbed that off. Um, only with Trump, I think it's gonna be a thousand times worse. I think they're gonna come after him. They're gonna do everything they can to erase every piece of legislation he's ever even considered signing. They're, they're gonna come after him with, with guns blazing. Um, yeah, both sides would like to, to forget the idea that a third party candidate ever made it in and both sides are gonna do everything they can to keep that from ever happening again, which that's a whole nother argument. So nightmarish situation. That happens. Can the startups continue as they are with the funding completely cut off? And here's the interesting question. If those contracts are cut, what are the severance? You know, what, what are the severance clauses look like? Because some of those may just be, we cut off the money and, and you're just stuck. Um, they could quite literally say, ISS is done. SpaceX is done. We're, we're NASA, you're back to mothballs. 
it would be the biggest disservice to this country. And I could see them do it. And it scares the living gee whiz out of me. Yeah, I wonder if that's really a risk with SpaceX because, um, you know, they've really, uh, the majority of their, their launches right now are for commercial uh, companies launching satellites and even their own satellites with uh, Starlink. Starlink uh, feels like maybe six months away from having its first customers. And I mean, what a huge market you could get from that. Um, you know, that's the catch is, is SpaceX far enough off government payrolls that they can do it. I think SpaceX is the one maybe in the group. Blue Origin. Blue well, Origin. Blue yeah. Origin is funded by uh, Jeff Bezos selling a billion dollars a year of his Amazon stock. Hey, yes and no. Blue Origin is actually getting a sizable amount of money from other sources. A billion dollars in the space industry does not go very far. Um, yes, it will allow him to build things. Having a rocket and being able to fly that rocket and being able to pay all the other costs, I don't know since, as I understand it, I don't remember if Blue Origin is a um, publicly traded company or not. If it's not, your books it's, are not open. It's private, completely private. 100% owned okay. by Jeff Bezos himself. Okay, so here's, here's the catch. If it is completely closed off, we don't know what their cash flow is. If they're losing money faster, then they can bring it in. Well, they're, um, not, they're not bringing in any money right now, other than maybe from, from uh, you know, some studies and some contracts for future launches and that type of thing. NASA and the Air Force right now have funded them. So what happens if those contracts get pulled? Because they actually did win a contract that got pulled on them by the Air Force. and. Um, there was a lot of talk about that contract not being properly bidded, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to see those things happen. I could see it being done. To, to say that Pelosi is uh, very upset over the things that Trump has said and done, and that I think that if uh, she could kill him, resurrect him and kill him 10 more times, she'd do it. And that if she could destroy everything that, that uh, constituted a legacy, she would dissolve Space Force if she could do it. If she could figure out a way to do it and it not hurt her ability to, to stay in power, she would do it. Um, th this is what bothers me. Um, there, there are groups that are very much against the things that he has done. And unfortunately, Space is one of those things he has done a lot for. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it has been very good because there are a lot of things that were shuttered by Obama. And as much as they like to say, yes, well, not everything was shuttered and everything. Let, let's be honest here. It wasn't like you know NASA was doing a lot of great things. Yes, there were things that we were doing, but they were things that had been started long before Obama was in, and he couldn't exactly just shut them off because they were international things. But they were shuttered. They weren't doing new and amazing things. Funding had been cut for major projects. We weren't doing anything new in the way of manned space flight. Mm. That, that's a big thing. If that what happens and we lose that. Um, and they pull the funding to the ISS. Then the only two space platforms are going to be Russian and Chinese. And if we let that stand, it pretty much means that we are sitting on the back seat watching all future research in space. And I think that is the absolute worst place we could possibly be. I think that is hazardous to us as a nation and 
hazardous to humankind because that basically says that we as an American people have nothing to gain or to uh, provide in the way of input. And if that's what Congress seems to think of us, uh, they need another thing. We need a new Congress. But I've been thinking we needed a new Congress for you know about 10, 20 years now. So uh, term limits would be a wonderful thing, but you know, that's another political thing. So if they are able to make Starlink work and work well enough and don't get me wrong. I, I can think of a lot of places in Wyoming, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, places that there is no internet service. Mm. Bingo. Those are places they can sell. Alaska, places they can sell. There are places Starlink will work well. I, I honestly, my wife will shoot me before she lets me do it because she's going to say, why are we paying for two internet services? But I do want to try Starlink. And if I could figure out a way to do it, even if it's on a short-term basis, I do want to take it, uh, it up to the top of, uh, of uh, Pikes Peak, and I want to see how it works up there. I want to see if I can actually play a game up there. I want to see if I can do MMOs. And then, you know, can I play Star Trek at the top of Pikes Peak via Starlink? You know, that would be very cool if I can do that. Um, these would be neat, interesting ideas that if you can demonstrate that it's got the latency to do that, then you have made a case for Starlink. Did you uh, sign up for the beta? I did. Oh, I've not heard back. I've not either. I think you're more um, likely to hear back uh, than I am. You're a little higher out uh, latitude than I am. So yes. Um, now here's the other thing. Uh, the astronomers, the visual astronomers, are going nuts. Are there uh, radio astronomers too? Some of them. I did point out to the visual astronomers when they went but basically bananas. I basically pointed out, you're not the only astronomers. There are radio astronomers, there are other astronomers, and also realize that there are other groups out there that also are going to create radio noise. And you need to wake up. This is kind of like the people that said, well, you have to take apart your car before you cross the street. And that was actually a law in New York City that to oh, cross wow. a street, you had to take apart your car, walk your car apart, and put it together on the other side of the street, and then keep going. That That's is the backwards thing. mentality. I'm sorry, but at some point, you're going to have to face reality. We are going to use the orbitals. Whether it's manned spacecraft, whether it's satellites, and what happens when I take my nice chunk of asteroid and bring it in for orbital processing? We haven't even done orbital mining yet. What happens when I park it right above your nice optical uh, uh, telescope and you complain because my asteroid's blocking your view every so often? And you've now got this, not, not a little chunk, we're now talking, you've got this disc that basically goes, you know, zoom, zoom, zoom. I, I mean, literally, that nobody's considering they're basically saying this is our sky and you can't do anything to it that that's okay my first question is who died and made you god second question is who gave you ownership i want to see your deed and title third question is let's talk about pay-per-view on all your papers and all my tax dollars that are paying for this and i got a better idea go take your giant telescope and go shove it where the daylight comes from yeah i'm not I'm not a big fan of these guys. They're, they're doing things that I don't agree with. They're doing things that are not helpful. And they're throwing a temper tantrum because it gives them attention. And I, I think it's a politics thing. Well, uh, Aaron, it's been a, a great um, conversation. We're almost coming up on the two hour mark. And I'm afraid I'm gonna have to go to bed. <laughs> but um, I was wondering if you had any like, uh, you know, I, I'm actually planning to put these on a micro SD card and send them uh, to the moon on astrobotic uh, mission next year. So next summer, uh, this this recording may make it to the moon and, and the future humans with their magical ability to reconstruct a micro SD card that's been irradiated and 
probably there melt it. <laughs> we'll be able to uh, see it. There you go. And we'll see whether or not my website's still around at that point in time. Um, uh, what's the URL for your website? It's uh, www.spacelaw.online. Online. OK. Yeah. And we've got tons of stuff on there. I've been throwing everything I can up there. Um, there's so much I want to do with this book. We'll see if I get it all put together. Um, the, the biggest thing is that space is out there for us to go. There's a lot of people that talk about manifest destiny. There's a lot of people that get hung up on the colonization piece. Really, if you're if you're going to, to if they're going to enact laws such that the idea is to confine us to Earth and say that we can't go there, then we're basically saying that we're going to live and die on this mud ball and go nowhere. In which case, uh we're done. We're going nowhere. The human race will go extinct. Uh, that seems like a very short-sighted uh, evolutionary process. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, no. I, I, I'm not okay with that for me and mine. I, I would much rather my kids go forth and explore space. I want them to go further. I want them to do things. I want them to um, I, I hope to see it in my my future, but it may be in my kids' or my grandkids' future, but I want them to go explore the moon, go explore Mars, um, go to Uranus, go to Pluto. I want to see somebody go ski on Uranus. I want to go ski mo the moon. You know, those are those would be cool things to do, to go see, to go do. Um, yes, there's cool things to do on the on Earth, but we've done a lot. There are other things we can go do. There are other places we can go see. And I really want them to go do that. But if you're just going to say, well, you have to stay on the earth because we said so. Who the hell are you that say I have to? That's the reason why we left the UK and came here for crying out loud is because somebody said you can't. Uh, that, that's never worked. You know, it's like your example about um, uh, airspace. Uh, we don't need everybody to agree with us. We just need them not to get in the way. And when people get in the way, that's never worked out well because um, the, the, the funny part I, I just love is everybody's worried about the U.S. because we have more guns per capita than anywhere else. So literally you're saying that you're going to stop the U.S. from doing this because I, I guarantee you there's going to be somebody that's going to bring a gun up to the moon there's going to be a claim jump and somebody's going to get shot. I'm just telling you how it is. And we're going to find out whether or not a gun works. And I just hope they're not from the state of Wyoming. I hope it's some somebody from California and then we can laugh. But I wouldn't be surprised if it's somebody from Wyoming that says, yeah, grab my old pappy's 20 gauge. And there ain't going to be no red that's going to get between me and my, my Nasra. <laughs> I can't do redneck very well, but I, I just I just don't see this as being reality. Reality is somebody's going to decide to do this. And the only question is going to be, do you think you can stop them before they do it? And then the question is how? And then at that point, it's just going to be a question of bodies. And then we're basically it's 1776 all over again. My goodness. And I, I really I don't want to see that happen, but there's that motto, plan for the best. Or plan for the worst, hope for the best, and we hope it's somewhere in between. Exactly. And I, I think you would completely love The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. So you might want to move that up a few a few books. I, I need to do that. The Moon is Our Mistress. Uh, okay. um, the Moon is a, a Harsh Mistress. Oh, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. By Bro Robert Heinlein. Yeah. Harsh Mistress. Well, I'll check out your website. It looks good. Um, and uh, thank you so much for your time. And okay. um, yep. There is one thing I did want to mention that's on there. Um, one of the things I'm trying to work out is carrying capacity of the orbitals. And I've got an Excel spreadsheet you can look at. It's just the numbers because I pulled all the um, formulas out so that I wouldn't have people monkeying with it. But basically, it's looking at based on what uh, NORAD says is a 15 or 1.5 kilometer high bubble and a 50 kilometer sphere. 
And then I basically said, okay. And then I incrementally did it all the way out to geo stationary orbit from, I think I set it up from a hundred kilometers all the way out. And I said, how many can I put in this space? And I'm still working on that because this gets into some math that I'm not really good at. And, but I've got a rough order of magnitude. And when you look at it, we can fit a ton of stuff up there. So the idea that we don't have enough space doesn't really fly for me. I just haven't quite pulled together enough to be able to argue the point cogently. I need to do better. But look at the PowerPoints in that. And if you've got questions, shoot me another email. We can do this again if, you, if you've got other questions in that. But uh, you're, you're welcome to look at them. Uh, some of them are kind of big. But it definitely it talks about the idea of are we, do we have too many satellites in order? And my argument, based on what I've done and what I've looked at, I think they're full of shit. I don't think we've got too much stuff. I think what it is, you've got the people that are up there, the haves, telling the have not, you can't come up. We don't want any more stuff up here. Mm -hmm. And this is the SpaceX being told, no, no, don't come up. Don't come up. We're full. We're full. We're full. Gets up there and goes, you guys are nuts. So uh, that's under downloads. I was just looking at that. Yeah, I'll take a look at that. It's a lot of uh, great information. Okay. And if you see something that you've got questions on or, or something that you're like, well, hey, what about this? Let me know um, because you may have seen something that I'm like, it makes perfect sense to me. But if you see something and you've got questions, then I can go look at it and go, oh, yeah. Okay, that doesn't make sense. I need to redo that. I need to reword that. And I'm always looking for feedback. So if you see something, I would love feedback because... That would be very helpful. I'd be more than happy to, uh, to do that. Cool. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's been awesome. Thank you. And thank again. Thank you again for your flexibility. Uh, so, no problem. No well, problem. You, you have a good night. And uh, hopefully, uh, 2030 is as, as great as I hope it will be. <laughs> I, I do too. I would like it to be a lot better than it is. And I, I am hopeful that things don't go south, I would really like to see space really continue its upswing. So we'll see what happens. So, Okay, good night. Good night, take care.